This story happened to me in a small country place in southern Illinois, about a month after my grandma passed away. My cousin got the will and ended up destroying the buildings near the house. There were two structures that were destroyed, an old cow barn and an old hay barn that was also used as a workshop. At times, both of these barns had bad vibes at night, but during the day everything always seemed peaceful. When you go in at night though, it was like everything changed. You could feel things watching you. You could hear things, but never see things. You always got the feeling that you weren't alone, and every once in a while too, you could get these whiffs of some kind of animal, like musk or decaying flesh or wet fur. It's weird, and I still to this day can't explain it. But anyway, my two cousins and I were sitting outside at 2 a.m., and we all suddenly started getting these weird vibes, like something was staring at us. Only we weren't by those barns. There was nothing around. It was late, there was no cars coming by, nobody else was out there. There was nothing with us, and no one with us, but something was definitely wrong. It was like we were at the area of the barn where we experienced these things multiple times, but we were up towards the house. We started looking around, trying to explain it, because honestly, all three of us started feeling the exact same way at the exact same time. You could see all of us just shift uncomfortably and start looking around. We voiced our feelings and agreed that something was definitely not right. So anyway... We're looking around, and we noticed these lights that looked like laser pointer lights aiming towards us. So, being three full-grown men that weren't afraid of anything, we did the only thing we could do. We hid for a little bit, playing the waiting game, you know? While we were hiding and waiting, we kept hearing noises on the back door of Grandma's house. We eventually had enough of it, mustered our courage, and decided to have a look for ourselves to see what the hell was going on, to see if we could finally catch a glimpse of this thing that had tormented us for God knows how long. My cousin had the bright idea of whistling if anything happened. He gave a little whistle to show us what he meant. And that's when something out in one of the fields did the exact same whistle. I mean, to the same pitch. Whatever it was out there was intelligent enough to mimic his whistle. That sent more chills down my spine than I've ever felt. And then two more whistles came out of nowhere. Not from the same area that the first whistle did, mind you. One in the field on the side of the house. That one whistled back first. Then one off to the left. And then one off to the right. Both of these other whistles came not even three seconds later. And then we heard something moving behind the barn that was still standing. A third barn. This one we never got any weird feelings around, but let me tell you, after that night, every bit of that land just felt weird. So here we are, standing in darkness at 2 a.m. with at least three things whistling around us. Maybe trying to communicate with us? Maybe mimicking the whistle that it heard and thinking that was some kind of intelligent way of communicating? Maybe it was taunting us. Who in the hell knows? But then the noises at the back door stopped. And that's when we saw these two shadow creatures staring at us. These shadows looked humanoid and solid, but they definitely were not even close to being human. We heard them growling. Then my cousin noticed their red eyes. Then in unison, these things exploded into speed, running as fast as I've ever seen anything move. They blew past us. We could feel the weight of them on the ground. The three of us took off towards the creek, trying to chase after them. They looked like they were headed towards the woods, and as terrifying as it was, chasing these creatures, not knowing what in the hell they were, we still ran after them because we wanted to protect our land. We were tired of being scared and we just needed answers. We needed to know what these things were. We got to this wide open hill on a bean field, and whatever these things were, 
did that same whistle right next to me. I mean, right next to me. Like, two feet away. It whistled right in our ears. We ran into the bean field, which had bean sprouts about five feet high, ready to fight for our lives, knowing how stupid it was for us to even give chase and be led out here into the middle of nowhere with no weapons, nothing to defend ourselves, and a long way from any type of shelter. But there was nothing there that we could see. After a second of realizing just how screwed we would be, we were all scared so bad, we ran all the way back to the house. Nothing else happened the rest of the night, but trust me, none of us got one single wink of sleep that entire night. We got back into the house where the guns lived, and all of us had a gun in our hands until daylight. About three days later, after everything calmed down, my mom was sitting on a couch by a window and heard the exact same whistle. It scared her so bad, she jumped up and started screaming and crying. She ran to me, and I went to check it out, this time with one of the guns. But once again, nothing was there. Whatever it was was long gone by the time I got out there. Because whatever these things are, are so incredibly fast that you don't even know that they're there before they're actually gone. You could definitely tell that something had been there though because of these impressions that it left on the grass. It looked like the heel of a human footprint if whatever it was was running around barefoot. We don't know if it was looking for my cousin that day or if it was after something else or someone else, but we didn't have any more experiences after that. Occasionally, we do hear these weird hollering noises at night. One of them will sound off in one area and then another one will sound off somewhere else like these things are communicating to each other or something. Whatever it was, never seen it again, but I truly believe it was something evil that my cousin startled. I also know that whatever it was terrified us, especially after we gave chase and it was so close to us and still couldn't be seen. In fact, all I can really remember seeing, all I could really make out were those red eyes. I mean, there was a shadow, sure, but I never saw anything corporeal, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So maybe this thing was some kind of demonic creature that was stalking those barns, and when we knocked them down, it freed them or pissed them off or something and it had to find somewhere else to terrorize. Maybe it was something that was attached to my grandma, or maybe she was keeping it in there, trying to keep us safe. There's so many different scenarios that play through my head all the time now. Part of me wants to know what these things are, and part of me wants to stay as far away from these things as possible. I just know that I've never experienced anything else like that. I've never felt fear like that. I've never heard anything so close to me and still not be able to see any type of creature or person that was standing there. It was dark, but I mean the moon was up in the sky and I could see my cousins, but this creature, whatever it was, was either camouflaged perfectly or cloaked or invisible or didn't have a corporeal form. Like I said, and I'll say it again, it was terrifying. When you're out there and you experience something like that, it just, it changes you. And I don't really like being out there at night anymore. In fact, I avoid it if I can. By the time the sun sets, I try to have everything that I need to do done. And I'm in the house when I'm over there. My cousins live there still. I don't. But I go over there a lot, and any time I'm there, that's the first thing I think about were those creatures that we experienced but never saw. I couldn't sleep for days after it happened. I'm still not sure what it is, and I would appreciate any type of feedback as to what these creatures could be. I've heard Dogman have the ability to cloak, and so do Bigfoot. And all the alien movies say the same thing, but I would really like opinions of other people that 
may have possibly experienced this to try to help me figure out what it was. Because even after all these years, I'm at a loss. Thanks for listening, and hopefully you can help me figure out what the hell it was that I saw that night. Or I guess, didn't see that night. I have a doozy of a story to tell you, man. I had a dog man on my own property, and even though I've never seen it since then, it's still something I'm constantly on the lookout for, because I have three little girls, and I want to make sure that nothing ever happens to them. I'm having my wife type this up for me, in her words, since I'm not the computer kind of guy, and it would take me forever to send this to you. But on my oath, this happened right here in my own yard. My name is Stephen Hatting, and I live in the Manisti County in Michigan. I'm 39 years old, been married to my gal for coming up on 20 years, and like I said, we have three little girls. When this encounter happened to me, I was home alone. My wife was pregnant with our third, and she and the girls were at her folks' house for the weekend. They were visiting her sister that was in town for a visit. I worked the swing shift, so that's why I wasn't at her folks' place. I was just getting back from work and pulled into the driveway. Our house is set off from the residential area by two and a half miles. It's nice and quiet where we are. Anyways, I pulled into the driveway and went to greet the lab that we had named Miles. Usually, he's a big goofy guy that jumps all over you when you come home, but this night he was acting really strange. He was whining and uneasy. He kept licking at me and pawing at me like he was trying to tell me something. He was definitely trying to tell me something was wrong looking back on this experience. And he was particularly interested in this set of trees off to the left of the house. We built a very nice enclosure for him to be outside when he wants to be, and when I'd come home for lunch, I'd let him out. He didn't want to come back in that day, so I had left him out there to be with his toys and his bowls. When I had left, he was acting just fine, but now he was really starting to worry me. He'd go over to the area of the fence closest to those trees and start whining again. Then he let out this loud bark that I'd never heard him do before. And I noticed all the hair on his back was standing up too. He was acting completely defensive. And like I said, this dog, he'd roll over for a complete stranger if it was something that he could get a belly rub out of. He never, ever acted like this. I looked out to where he was so interested and knew that something Probably some kind of animal was out there, but still, the way that he was acting just made me kind of nervous. And then I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. Hell, maybe it skipped a couple beats. Because standing behind one of the bigger trees was this creature. And it was peeking out from behind the tree and looking at us. At a very first glance, I thought it was a man because it was standing upright, but... Not more than a second after seeing this, I realized it was no man. For starters, it would have to be damn near nine feet tall of a man. I got a good look at this thing, because it didn't act scared of me at all. It just stood there staring right back at me. It looked like a big dog on two legs, kind of like a Rottweiler. It had a big head, bigger than anything I'd ever seen. It had a big round muzzle and a lot of shaggy hair around the neck area. The fur was black, but not shaggy like it was around the main area on the neck. It looked about the same length as Miles' hair, actually. It had an arm wrapped around the tree, and I could only see one side of the body because the other half was still behind the tree. It was flat-footed, not digit-grade like the other encounters that I've read about. I backed up and grabbed Miles' collar. I was trying to get him into the house, but I was damn near dragging him because he didn't want to leave that area. He wanted to protect me, I guess, because he wouldn't budge. And he's a big boy, too. 95 pounds of dog right there. He was growling and barking at this thing and going crazy. And then I heard it growl back at him. It was deep and long and the most intimidating thing that I've ever heard. 
I looked back to where I had seen it and watched it step out from behind the tree completely. And this thing looked like it could tear me apart. The legs were really muscular, like some of those pro wrestlers like Triple H, only on a massive scale. The legs looked almost human, but covered in that same hair that was over the rest of its body. The arms looked human too, but again, on a massive, extremely muscular level. And its eyes seemed to shine. That was really spooky. It looked like they were just glowing on their own. I knew what I was looking at. You hear a lot of stories around Michigan and the surrounding states. I just never thought that I would see one myself. I would have thought it was a Sasquatch if it didn't look so canine. And it just stood there, staring, and then lifted its head up and started sniffing the air. The whole time, I'm trying to drag my damn dog into the house, and I finally got him in the house and bolted the door. I knew the door wouldn't stop this giant if it wanted to come in, but it still gave me just a little bit of comfort. The first thing I did after that was go to our bedroom and grab my Remington Model 700. And let me tell you, that made me feel a whole lot better, because I'm one hell of a shot. I went back into the dining room, where you could see the trees that that thing was at, and looked outside. And it was still there, but now it was facing in another direction. My direction. It knew where I was in the house, and I didn't even have the light on in the dining room. Miles was pacing around the house, switching back and forth between whining and growling, and my worry was that he would go after this thing and it would tear him to shreds. He's a big brave dog and he can hold his own but not up against something like this. I just remember feeling so relieved that the kids and my wife weren't at home this night because I didn't know how long that thing had been stalking the house and I didn't know what this thing wanted. I mean, my kids play out there with Miles. If they'd been home, it may have attacked them. What if it saw them as easy prey? I don't know what I would have done if that thing hurt either of my babies. I watched this thing for maybe another couple of minutes until it started walking towards the house. Let me tell you, I probably actually shit my pants right there. The way it walked was just so human-like. So human-like that it's disturbing even now thinking about it. When it moved, you could really get an appreciation for how big this damn thing was. But I knew I had to do something because it was getting closer to the house. I didn't want it to just fling the door open and devour me. And I didn't want to just fling the door open and start shooting because I was afraid Miles would take off after it. I ended up flinging the door open anyways though. Huh, I know. Crazy, right? I just couldn't have that thing that close to my home. When I flung the door open, thank God, Miles didn't run after it. He actually stayed by my side and started barking. And I started yelling for all I was worth, trying to be as loud and intimidating as possible. When I did this, that thing stopped and turned to us. I could hear this thing growling even over the ruckus that I was making and the barks that Miles was trying to use to intimidate this creature too. And then it let out this unearthly roar. I'd never heard anything sound so angry in my entire life. And remember, I'm married, folks. I know angry. I aimed my gun. I was ready to take this thing down, but this thing recognized what a gun was. It looked at it, and then it took off towards the woods. This damn thing actually recognized a gun. I was so surprised by how it acted that I couldn't even aim my rifle. This thing sprinted away from the house like an Olympic athlete. It moved like nothing I'd ever seen before. It was as fast as lightning, as agile as a cheetah. I saw the back of it. There was no tail to be seen. It didn't move its legs like a dog either. This creature ran like a man. I ended up putting a bullet in the ground hopefully to scare it. I couldn't take a shot knowing that I might miss. It was just too fast. What if that stray bullet had hit someone? We didn't live close, but I still couldn't take a chance of injuring somebody. 
when I knew that I probably wasn't going to hit this target. When it ran through the woods, I could hear it crashing through all of the brush. And I thought that that would be the end of it. That I scared this creature off. But it wasn't. Because that thing came back that same night. In between those encounters, I had called my wife and told her what I saw. She begged me to come to her folks, but it was already one in the morning by this point, and her folks lived over an hour away. Besides, I needed to be there in case it came back. I'd kill it if I had to, and I knew that wouldn't be an easy feat, but I wasn't going to let this monster terrorize my home where I was raising my family. I ended up sleeping on the couch with Miles had the lights on and my rifle by me, and I woke up to Miles acting strange all over again, just like he was the first time we saw that thing. And as soon as I heard him making those noises, saw how uneasy he was, I knew that that creature was back. I grabbed my rifle and started looking through the windows, but I couldn't catch a glimpse of it. And then I saw the shadow of something big moving out by Miles's pen. And sure enough, it was that damn dogman again. I knew I had to chase it off, or kill it, just like any other wild animal. Now, let me explain my view on this before I get going any further. I love nature. The good and the bad of it. I don't think any differently between a rattlesnake and a deer. It's all nature. All part of the ecosystem. And I guess I felt the same way about this thing because I didn't want to have to kill it. I know that sounds crazy, that these creatures defy explanation, but I just felt like it would be the same as if a bear or a wolf or a mountain lion was on my property. I'd try to scare it off before resorting to putting it down. I tried to scare it off once and it didn't work. I was going to try one final time to get it to go before I put a bullet in it. I watched this thing start moving around, and then when I felt it was a safe enough distance, I went back outside with my rifle and miles. The night was as quiet as a church mouse. It was like every little critter in the woods stopped talking and wanted to watch how this played out. I mean, disturbingly quiet, not a peep from anything except me and Miles. I saw that dogman peeking from behind a tree again. It saw me and stepped out, and it actually looked like it was sizing me up. I started yelling at it to go away, but of course, it wasn't going to be that easy. Your YouTube people are probably listening to this and thinking this guy is either the bravest person in the world or the stupidest. Well, let me tell you, I'm neither. I was terrified being out there. Don't get me wrong about that. I was absolutely petrified. I'm about 20 yards from this thing, and I appreciated everything about how deadly this thing looked. It started moving towards me, very agitated and menacing. I thought it was about to charge, actually, and I started yelling at it again and waving my arms, but it still kept coming. I raised my rifle hoping that it would see it and run off again, but this time it didn't run off. It just kept coming at me. So I shot. The next part all happened so fast I barely had time to register it. Now I know I hit it. I know the bullet went into its chest. It didn't kill it though. It should have killed it good and proper. It was a kill shot. But all it did was wound this son of a bitch. That thing screamed out like the devil was coming straight out of hell, and that scream scared the hell out of me. I thought it was a sign that my own death was coming, that I had signed my own death certificate right there. That scream still haunts me to this day. I can still hear it like it just happened. This thing staggered backwards and actually looked at its chest like it was shocked that I shot it. It turned and ran again, still on two legs. I never ever saw it on four legs. 
It ran into the woods just as fast as last time. I know it was wounded. It had to be. I shot it at 20 yards with my Remington. It should have killed it. I ran back into the house with Miles. The sweat that was pouring off of me was a cold sweat. I was on the verge of hyperventilating. I remember slamming the door, locking it, and then just moving into the center of the room, unsure of what to even do. I wanted to be as far away from the walls and the door and the window as possible. I didn't know if that thing was going to come back. But I did know one thing for sure. There was no way I was sleeping at all that night. And Miles and I stayed up the rest of the night. In the morning, I called my wife again and told her everything. They were supposed to be coming home the day after that, but I had her stay an extra couple of days so I could make sure that this thing didn't come back. I told my brother and a couple of my hunting buddies that I knew would believe me, and we spent the next two days searching the woods for a body of this thing. We never found anything. My brother stayed over the next two nights just in case it came back, but it never did. There are reports of these things all over Michigan, and I can safely say that I believe them 110%. The thing that gets me though, that perplexes me, makes me think that there's something else out there too, is that the one I saw didn't look like your standard werewolf variety that you hear about around here. There was no tail, looked more human. The legs were shaped differently. I saw this other YouTube show, I don't remember which one though, where this fellow talked about different breeds or something like that, and he talked about a different variety. And that's what I think I had on my property that night. A different breed or species or something like that. It's been years since that dogman was here, but I'm still as cautious as ever. I got my little ones to worry about, you know. Miles is still alive and kicking. Just turned 10 in July. He's never acted like he did that night either. And I thank God for that because he was my early warning system, so to speak. I knew that the way he acted, it was just so unlike him that something had to be wrong. And I trust his instincts because I do 100% believe that he saved my life that night. We installed motion detectors and security cameras just to be on the safe side. And my wife has her own weapons now too. Honestly, I don't know if I killed it or scared it off. Either way, it hasn't been back. And I'm grateful. Do you think there's other things out there like Dogman? Do you think there's some kind of natural species? I don't know because natural species die when you shoot them in the chest with a rifle. What if they aren't though? What if they're some kind of supernatural creature? If they're really different varieties of them, I'd hate to have an encounter with another one. This one didn't act too aggressive, but believe you me, it was dangerous enough. Not aggressive, but intimidating and comfortable and confident. Like it knew, if it did go up against me, I was cannon fodder. I was nothing more than an easy meal waiting to be picked off. I wouldn't want to have a run-in with one of the more aggressive breeds. Anyway, I think we've gone on long enough, and I want to thank you for presenting this. Yours truly, Stephen Hatting. When I was 14, my nan, who was a witch, told me about the Ouija board. I learned that it was an effective way to contact spirits, and that she used it when contacting spirits for other people. My nan was a very versatile witch. She practiced both good and black magic, but wasn't good nor bad herself. She did as people asked, but always warned them of the repercussions and consequences that could come from magic, whether that be curses, hexes, or black magic. Now, being young and stupid, I decided that me and my friends should try out using a Ouija board. So we set up a sleepover 
and we did this in my bedroom. We made our board out of cardboard and used a 50 cent piece as our planchet. I truly believe that was our first mistake looking back on this, because at least with a glass, you can close the connection. If you didn't know, when you use a Ouija board, you need to open and close a spiritual circle. You do this by asking for divine light to come and open and close the connection between us and the spirits. This is a witch's belief anyway, and a way of life. I'm telling you, it works no matter what you use. We didn't protect ourselves in any way either, and we started giggling and laughing as soon as we did this. We were asking questions and got replies, but honestly, we all blamed each other for moving it. Just your typical crap that kids do when trying out these types of things. We asked questions like, what's your name? How old were you when you died? How'd you die? What was it like? Could you help us connect with dead family members? We would ask these questions verbally, and the answers would be spelt out for us on the Ouija board. This spirit said its name was Fran. She was 53 years old, and when she died, she was murdered. We thought it was hysterical, honestly thinking that each other was moving the planchet. When we got bored, I knew that we should ask it to leave, and when I did, the planchet actually moved to no. We kept asking it to go, but every time, it would go back to no. And by now, we're fed up, because we thought one of us was moving it and just messing with us. So we all just took our hands off of it, and I put this homemade Ouija board under my bed and the coin back on my desk. At the time, I had bunk beds, and one of my friends was sleeping on the bottom while I was on the top. I wasn't very heavy, and I had slept on that bunk many, many times before. It was uneventful at first, but in the middle of the night, the top bunk collapsed onto my friend. It made the loudest noise I've ever heard, and my friend was screaming for help. My other friends freaked out. I told them it was an accident, and my mom came in and asked what happened. I said I wasn't sure, and that I would just sleep on the floor and she could check in the morning, because luckily, my friend wasn't hurt, just shaken up and squashed with a minor bruise on her right leg. The next day, my mom asked me if I'd been messing with the screws that hold the top bunk up, and I told her, no, I wouldn't even know how to do that. But she pointed out that someone had actually unscrewed the top bunk so it would fall. This was only the beginning of our problems. A few days went by, and lights and TVs would start to turn on and off. Things would move around, but I still didn't tell my mom what I'd done with the Ouija board because I didn't want to get in trouble. There were a few occasions where I thought I heard my name being called too, but I just shrugged it off as paranoia. I'd see shadows moving out of the corner of my eye, but again, it could have just been the paranoia, right? Well, looking back on it, wrong. Objects started to appear in different locations. Things like makeup, my school books, my house keys, TV remote controls, anything that could be an inconvenience, basically. One night, I was lying in bed and I felt horrible, like I was being watched, but there was nobody there in the room with me. There was no specific place that I thought the spirit was in my room, more like my entire room was just off and heavy. The next day, in the late evening, something poked me. It was definitely a finger that poked me, I'll swear on a stack of Bibles to this day. I felt the hard end of a finger poke me and actually I felt it more than once. It was like the more I freaked out, the more it did it. It didn't hurt, but imagine being there, sitting in your room alone, and having something poke you that you can't see. That's some scary shit. I was freaking out and crying for my mom, saying that something was there. She looked around and swore to me that nothing was there, but it didn't calm me down. I didn't see or hear anything, but I knew that something was there. For the rest of the night though, nothing else happened. I really believe that it could only do certain things due to the amount of energy that it takes a spirit to accumulate in order to do these things. So for a while after that, it was just simple things that were happening. But eventually everything came to blows. It was evening and I was doing my homework in my room. 
all of a sudden, the pictures on my wall were being blown off and thrown at me in full force. I was screaming and covering my head when my mom ran in and saw this. When the pictures were all off the walls, all the paranormal activity stopped for the night. But at least my mom knew then that something was very wrong and we clearly had a poltergeist. Or maybe something even worse. I finally had to break down and tell her about the Ouija board. There was just too much stuff going on and things were starting to get violent. She called a priest. He said he could come by in two days and try not to provoke this thing before he could get there. Well, I tried my best not to provoke it. I didn't do anything intentional that I thought might set it off. I prayed and hoped that praying wouldn't provoke it. I felt that the more freaked out or angry I was, the more this thing was provoked. And man, I was told off so bad for messing with a Ouija board. But because I was clearly terrified, my mom let me have a friend over. That looking back wasn't a very good idea either because I lost a friend because of that. She didn't die, if that's what you're thinking, but she never really talked to me again after that night. You see, we were asleep and I heard this loud ringing noise. I shot up and saw that my friend was against the radiator, actually being pinned and choked by this poltergeist. She wasn't standing or levitating, but she was on her butt with her legs out in front of her. Not like in the movies when this happens. Let me tell you, this was completely different. And no matter what movie you're watching and you think it's scary, seeing it actually happen to a friend right there is a hundred times scarier. Once again, I started screaming. This was just something that I couldn't handle. My mom ran in, frantic, shouts in the name of the Lord to let my friend go. It did, but she was so shocked and terrified that she went home. The next day, she actually had hand marks around her neck, like someone had tried to choke her. She told me that she heard a growl, but it was strange. It was more like a person clearing their throat rather than this deep evil growl and she didn't see anything she just felt something around her neck also whatever it was she couldn't move she told her parents about it what was said I don't know because it was kept between the adults just my parents and hers she never came to my house again the next two days were pretty uneventful just the usual moving of the objects but I did leave the pictures off my walls because I'd be damned if that creature or that poltergeist or whatever the hell it was started throwing them at me again. Finally, the priest came. He blessed the house. He left a Bible open on my windowsill with a cross above it. He confirmed that it was a poltergeist and that her name really was Fran. She'd experienced a violent death and was tormented. She was neither good or bad, but enjoyed being a pain in the ass, I guess. The priest had no trouble dealing with her. He got rid of her and I never messed with the Ouija board ever again. I had caused this by letting a spirit in that was not so nice. I was never going to make that mistake again. And as for the Ouija board, that thing was ripped up and burnt. I was 12 years old and in fifth grade, I believe. My family lived in Central Texas. At the time, my school went on a camping trip. My particular class group was at camp for six days from Monday till Saturday. It all started on a Tuesday night when me and my two friends, Nick and Jack, were outside playing kickball. I should mention that the cabins we stayed in were arranged in a semicircle around a large bluff. As we played, Jack hit the ball up onto one of the lower edges of a cliff. As I was the closest to the bluff, I shouted that I could get it. I climbed up to the bluff, but I had the strange feeling of dread creeping down my spine all of a sudden. My instincts told me to look up, and that was possibly the worst mistake that I have ever made in my entire life, because about 300 yards up the bluff were these eyes. When most people describe the eyes, they say they're usually red or gold. But these eyes were a sickening orange-yellow color. 
I mean, I was practically frozen. Nick walked up to me and asked if I was okay. I looked over at him, and I pointed up at the pair of eyes. If you've never seen the color drain from someone's face, let me tell you, it's quite dreadful. Because that's exactly what happened to Nick. He went completely pale, ghost white, because he saw those same eyes that I did. Jack walked up on my right, but he never looked at Nick or I. He'd already seen the eyes. He knew what was going on. That wasn't even the worst part. The thing that had those eyes began to move down the bluff, and we saw this thing for what it really was. It looked like a werewolf. We could make out all of the details. It was on four legs, a quadruped. It looked like a dog, but it was huge. Honestly, it looked like some movie monster werewolf. Its head was at least twice the size of a dog's head. Unlike a bear, its body was skinny and more athletic looking and toned. And the worst part were those forearms. They had these human-like hands. Some kind of monstrosity that was halfway between wolf and man. I remember thinking to myself, well I guess that's why they call it a wolf man. When it first moved, it walked like someone doing an ape-like walk, but then these paws uncurled, revealing these five grotesque looking fingers that were tipped with these yellow claws. This thing, this werewolf or whatever it was, stared at us the entire time it moved. It's like this thing refused to break eye contact with us. And it looked like it was smiling but not a happy smile, a malicious smile. Like it was glad that we were terrified or something. And as quickly as it appeared, it crawled away, climbing up the bluff. But before it disappeared, it looked right back at us and I felt that it was looking directly at me. The next morning, all three of us decided to go look at the spot where that wolf thing was. We crawled up the bluff for about 400 yards and then came to a flat ledge. There was a vertical wall of stone behind it, and there lying on the ground was a deer. Or what was left of it anyway. This doe's carcass was missing its hind quarters and most of its guts. Its head and part of its neck were being held by these thin strands of meat. I almost vomited. Nick started to scream. Our counselor soon found us after that. I guess he had seen us wandering around and followed us from our cabin. But you know what? I'm glad he did. I wanted somebody that was responsible for us and could keep us safe there. What on earth are you guys doing up here? I remember him yelling. Why are you screaming? He scolded us angrily, but before he could really lay into us, he saw the deer too. He told us to get back to the cabin. He tried to get in front of us to keep us from seeing the animal, but it was already way too late for that. The only other time I saw this creature on that camping trip was on that Friday. It was the day before we left that camp. At this point, each cabin was split into class groups that we were assigned to do this camp out with, and we were supposed to camp out somewhere around the camp's property, not in any of the cabins. Of course, Nick, Jack, and I were grouped up even though they weren't in my class. We were all Boy Scouts together after all, so I guess that's why we were grouped together and we did have quite a bit of experience camping. Anyways, when it was our turn to camp outside the building, we ended up deciding to make a raised platform. I mean, the last thing we wanted was a rattlesnake or something like that slithering into the tent. And then that night about midnight, when Nick had already gone to sleep, Jack and I had stayed up and were talking by the fire pit, and we heard this noise. It was a sound like nothing I'd ever heard before. It was low and guttural, like a mix between a wolf howl and a feminine-style scream of a mountain lion. Immediately, I thought of this creature that we saw earlier that week. Why we even agreed to go out there and camp after seeing this creature the first time is beyond me, but I figured that maybe it was just some kind of big wolf and we had scared it off. Maybe it made that kill with the doe, got its meat, and left. But this noise brought me back to that morning when we saw that creature. I did not 
want to be outside with that thing. I looked over at Jack and told him we needed to go inside the tent and get some sleep. He nodded and we climbed onto the platform and went into the tent to sleep. Now I know a lot of you are thinking, why in the hell would you go to sleep when you saw something like this out there, knowing that there's some kind of monster potentially out there stalking you from the shadows? I didn't think I'd get to sleep either. I honestly just wanted some kind of barricade between me and that creature, and the tent was the only thing I had. It's amazing to think that you can look at this tiny sheet of canvas and somehow feel safe. I guess honestly it's just because you're not looking around outside and staring into the darkness of the woods. I mean, that creature could just shred that tent to pieces and devour all of us. Miraculously, we did manage to go to sleep. I don't know if it's because we were exhausted or some other reason, but I did fall asleep for a little bit, even though it was completely short-lived. I woke up in the middle of the night to hear a scraping sound. I looked over my shoulder and found a familiar dirty yellow claw actually poking through the thin wall of that tent just behind me. I screamed, and almost at the same time we heard this echoing boom. It was so loud. At first I didn't even know what it was. I thought that this creature was breaking down the tent, but apparently someone had fired a gun. The claw disappeared, and then there was this sound of something big, something heavy, running back through the forest. I could hear footsteps that sounded incredibly heavy. I could hear twigs and branches snapping as this thing fled from our tent. It was our counselor. He's the one that fired the shot and probably saved our lives. He managed to scare that thing away. We confronted him about it, but he seemed to deny everything that he saw. In fact, he said he didn't see anything at all. He thought that there was some kind of wild animal behind the tent that he didn't get a good look at. He feared for us, so he fired a warning shot to scare it away. I know, though, that he knows more than he's telling us, because he had the same look on his face that Nick did when he saw that creature the first time. Absolutely all the color was drained from his face. We talked about it. He denied it. We talked about it again. He denied it then. I know he saw more than what he's saying. For months after we experienced it, I lost a lot of sleep. I couldn't close my eyes without seeing that claw in our tent. I couldn't close my eyes without thinking about the creature going down that bluff. I couldn't help but imagine it every single time I closed my eyes. I had dreams of those claws raking down my back. I had dreams of that creature staring in through the tent or staring in through the windows of my own house. Honestly, that thing's probably going to give me nightmares for the rest of my life. We've never gone back there. Nick and Jack and I are still friends, and we talk about it sometimes. We just refer to it as the Wolfman, because honestly, there's nothing else that it could be. It looked just like they do in the movies. So really, it made a believer out of me. I don't know if I'll ever go back into the woods again after seeing that, which is a pity because I do like to camp, but when you see something like that it changes your life and it changes your outlook on the world. I know a lot of people have asked the same question on your channel because I've listened to every episode trying to figure out if anybody else has seen something like I did, and it sounds like there are a lot of people with this dogman phenomenon. But the question that I ask that a lot of other people have asked is, if this thing is real and is really out there, then what else is out there too?
First off, I'd like to say how much I'm enjoying your channel so far. Keep up the good work. I'd also like to share my encounter with you. It happened to me when I was driving home from work one night in 2013. I was on a country road that I drive every single night, and it was about 2 a.m. The road is two lanes, one going west and one going east. On both sides are apple orchards. Now usually I love driving down this road at night. I love the fresh air, the smell of the apples. You could spot possums and rabbits and raccoons regularly. And once I think I even saw a bobcat. But this night was just different though. As soon as I got on the road, I just had this very uneasy feeling. The first weird thing that happened was my music started to skip on my radio, which is weird because I was listening to my iPod and that music doesn't skip. I shrugged and changed the song. Everything was fine for about 20 seconds and then that song started skipping too. Then I noticed this glowing light on the side of the road. It was still pretty far up ahead and I thought to myself that it looked like a car pointed in the wrong direction. So I slowed down, not knowing if I was going to have to dodge an oncoming drunk driver or if it was someone's car who had broken down. But as I got closer, I realized that this didn't really look like a headlight. The shape was all wrong. The light was tall, and there was only one, not two, and the color was wrong too. It was this pale blue light, not the light that's white or yellow like a headlight. I slowed to a stop to watch the light and pulled over to the side. This light wasn't moving, but I knew that something was just not right with this situation. There was something off about it, and it seemed like whatever this was was glowing from the inside. Not like a headlight or a light bulb, but like one of those stars you put on your ceiling. A text from my wife nearly made me crap myself. She asked where I was, as usually I'm home about 20 minutes after my shift. And I realized that I'd been staring at this thing for almost 10 minutes without even realizing it. How did I lose so much time? Shit, I gotta get home, I said to myself. And I started to text her back, but my screen froze. This isn't an unusual thing though. My phone was old, and it was already giving me troubles. Usually I just turn it off and then turn it back on and it works fine. It was just frustrating to have to deal with that at the moment when I really needed it. I looked back up at this light while I was waiting for my phone to turn back on, and it was further from the side of the road than before, more towards the orchards. I watched it for a few seconds while I waited for that phone, still wondering what the hell this thing was in front of me. Whatever it was hadn't moved the entire time that I was staring at it for those 10 minutes, but the moment I took my eyes off it, it moved. Finally, my phone turned back on, but again, the damn thing was frozen. Honestly, I felt like smashing it, and I promised myself I'd get a new one the very next day and stop being so cheap. I again turned the dumb thing off and waited for it to turn back on, returning my gaze to this phantom light, and the damn thing looked like it was coming in my direction. Part of me was curious to see what it was, but the other part just wanted to get out of there. It wasn't coming towards me in a straight line, but rather in a diagonal way, like it was heading towards me, but the orchards at the same time. It was moving about the average speed that a normal person would walk. Not slow, but not at a fast pace either, just a normal pace. And when it got close enough, my breath caught in my chest because I finally got a good look at this thing. It looked like it was walking, moving its legs back and forth. It was tall and slender. It definitely wasn't a car or a tractor. It was some kind of creature. And whatever it was, it was illuminating itself from the inside out. It kept moving like it either didn't notice me or didn't care that I was there. And the way it walked was just so graceful. Almost like it was gliding instead of walking. But like I said, it was moving its legs in a walking motion. I turned my lights off and I sat there and watched, dumbfounded. Just what in the hell was it that I was looking at? Was it an alien? Or an angel? This thing stopped again and raised its head towards the sky. I'm not sure what it was doing to this day, but at the time I thought it might be smelling the air. Hell, 
For all I know, it was looking up at its spaceship. Then, it looked right at me. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to get the hell out of there, but the curiosity was just so overwhelming that I couldn't pull myself away. It was like I was in a trance or something. Now, one thing you need to know about me is I am not good judging distance at all. So I don't know exactly how close this thing was to me. But at this point, it was close enough to make out features. And the closer it got to me, the more I could see. It didn't have any clothes on. But it wasn't hairy either. There was no hair anywhere on the body that I could see. The body looked smooth and soft. There was no male or female anatomy. And it was tall and skinny. It had this shiny, glowing blue light radiating from its body. And that light, it wasn't blinding or anything like that. It was actually soft and nice to look at. Its head was normal human size, but it didn't have ears and like I said, no hair, not even on top of its head. Its nose and mouth were tiny, like they were pinched together or something. The eyes though, were what I'll never forget. They were the size of eyes themselves, not anything special. Maybe just a little bigger than ours, but the iris and the pupil were huge and I could tell this because of the way that they illuminated themselves. They were this bright, bright blue, like a glow stick, and they illuminated more than the skin did. At the closest point to me, this thing would probably be 10 feet away, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Again, I stress, I'm not good with distance. It stared at me, and I stared at it, and the weirdest thing was that I wasn't scared at all. It was almost peaceful. I felt calm and happy to look at this creature that I couldn't dream up in my wildest dreams. And I got the distinct feeling that it wanted me to feel like I had nothing to fear. It looked at me with these gentle eyes, and it blinked ever so softly. All of a sudden, it slowly looked over into the apple orchard and walked off into it. This thing never made a sound. I heard no footsteps in the dirt, no voice, no breathing, nothing. In fact, I don't even remember seeing any dirt kicked up as this thing moved. Like I said, it's like this thing was gliding. So I don't know if it was even touching the ground. I sat and watched it go until it was out of sight, but I could still make out that faint light through the orchard. And then, all of a sudden, I snapped back into focus, like I had just woken up or came out of a trance. I remember everything perfectly. That night is still vivid in my mind ten years later, but that trance, I can still not explain it. It was just like I was mesmerized, like I knew I was watching something that wasn't supposed to be here and my mind either couldn't comprehend or had turned off every other function so I could focus on this creature. Let me tell you, I was suddenly very aware of my situation though, and I looked at my phone again. Another 15 minutes had passed. It felt like seconds. I quickly turned on my lights, put my car in drive, and sped home. Once I got home, I had a hard time getting my wife to believe my story but I swore to her that everything that I was telling her was true and finally she accepted it. Although I'm still not too sure she doesn't think I parked on the side of the road and drifted off to sleep or something. And you know what? I still drive down that road every night after work and believe me, I keep my eyes open for it but I've never seen this creature again. I've never seen any sign of anything paranormal. Part of me hopes that one day though I can encounter it again. Maybe even try to communicate with it and figure out what it is and what it wants. Honestly, I don't think it means any harm. I have no idea what it was. I don't even know where to begin to look online. Everything I type in just comes up with reddits and all that kind of crap now. I firmly believe though that whatever it was, it was responsible for my car and my phone problems that night. I truly, truly believe that it meant no harm at all. It's not a scary story, I know, but it's a story that I can't explain. It wasn't just something that I misidentified, you know what I mean? Nothing around here glows in the dark. Whatever it was, 
an angel, an alien, some kind of weird government creation. I hope one day I can find out what it is. A pretty good chunk of my childhood was spent playing near the river that ran back behind our house. Looking back, I kind of wondered how my parents were able to live with themselves letting me play unsupervised next to such a considerable body of water. Even though it never flooded, I can count on one hand how many times I saw white water in that stream. Huh. Child Protective Services would probably frown upon it at these days. But it was mostly safe, right? Eventually, I discovered a threat to my well-being that wasn't exactly the water. It would be years before I would see it. It was more like hours before I could fully even understand what I'd been seeing and all the danger that I was in. But not really comprehend exactly what it was either. I know this sounds vague, and trust me, I'll get into it, but I'm writing this and I'm still just at a loss for words as to what it was that I saw. As far as I ever knew, it was just a river that was teeming with fish and other forms of marine life. It's typical for the Midwest. It ran that nice chocolate color that you would expect from every river in the region. It didn't seem to hold back the life from thriving though. Sometimes I thought I'd seen some impressively large fish. I thought the fish were pretty normal but every once in a while, I'd be by the river and smell something awful. Worse than anything I've ever smelt. Worse than the garbage when it sits around for a couple of days. There were even a few times it was so potent I practically vomited, and then I had to stay because I didn't want my mom to know that I had thrown up. Within a day, that smell would be gone, and I would resume playing like normal. It was during these especially hot summer days that the river dropped well below average. It was to the point where there were bald spots of exposed riverbed. As a kid, you would have thought that I just discovered a buried treasure. I found little pieces of rock and shale and other secrets kept by the river, even old coins and rocks that were rubbed smooth by the water, even some badly corroded wristwatches. Further downstream, further than I usually explored, I found something rather shocking though. Bones. Animal bones. And every last one of them were spooky and mesmerizing to me. Something about the way the hollow eye sockets looked at me. Those empty skulls freaked me out. The way they make me feel was like they were staring right back at me even though there was nothing in them to stare at me. It really creeped me out. Like I said, I was just a little kid. The spookiness wasn't helped by the fact that each skull was submerged by a couple inches of water, so they had that predatorial look that crocodiles do when they're stalking their prey. Now, I had no plans to go near them. At least, not until I noticed something else unusual. All the fish that I was used to seeing around here were resting around these bones. Now, you have to take into the fact that usually these water levels are much higher. So I figured that because the water was so low, these fish had nowhere to swim. Once in a while, these fish would twitch or try to swim just a couple of inches. But there was just something about these fish that I couldn't wrap my head around. So that's why I went closer, out of curiosity's sake. And for the first time, I noticed that I couldn't tell where these fish's heads or tails were placed. Something about them were wrong. Very, very wrong. Their shapes were incredibly unusual. Actually, the word that I would use would be incomprehensible. I went down into the riverbed to get a closer look, right up until the edge of the water. I stared at those partially submerged bones, trying to figure out what it was that I was staring at. As soon as the ripples for my feet reached the bones, something began to happen though. The fish 
or whatever they were, began working their way onto the bones. And the bones moved in this writhing mass of strange fish. The fish wrapped around some of these bones, and the piles of bones began to move, even as some of these fish started stretching and wrapping themselves around the joints. As the fish started to manipulate these joints, that's when it dawned on me with some horrific revelation as to why I couldn't figure out what kind of fish I'd been looking at and why the appearance was so damn confusing. These things weren't fish at all. They looked more like internal organs in bits and pieces. I could see bones and tendons and muscle tissue. And right before my eyes, this abomination began to form. A thing with a skull of a buck with shattered antlers. The skulls of smaller animals for shoulders. A rib cage that may or may not have belonged to a deer. Possibly something else. I could never know. One of the arms was definitely the leg bone of something, and the bones were puppeteered by this contracting, rising, and throbbing of these internal organs, like they were choreographed together. It looked like this obscene ballet that was trying to make a mockery of life. I heard no voices. There was no speech. There was nothing physically making any type of noise. But I had these thoughts planted into my mind. Somehow I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that whatever this monstrosity was wanted to add my bones and my internal organs to this collection at the bottom of the riverbed. My organs, my flesh, it would swim in the waters and separate into pieces until some other living victim would come near. And that creature that was now composed of all of these animals and myself would devour it and add it to its collection. I knew that. To this day, I can't explain why I knew that or how I felt that, but I knew that this thing that I was looking at wanted to collect me. It wanted to collect anything that got close to it. Everything at the bottom of the riverbed would congeal together after that and make another kill, another skull in the collection of available bones and organs. I felt that. This necromantic monster wielded a large femur covered in black insects. I never ran so fast in my life. I slipped a bit when I was climbing the wall of the riverbed, but under the power of adrenaline I was able to scale it and ran until I made it home without ever looking back. Much later, I would find out that the smell that was invading my nostrils was the smell of rotting dead fish and dead meat. I now have a miniature heart attack whenever I get a whiff of something that smells like that. Whether it's a squirrel that crawled into the porch and died, or a nearby corpse of an animal that fell out of a tree like a bird, it doesn't matter. Anytime I smell that death, it hits me and brings me right back to that memory of that thing that wanted to add me to its collection of available body parts on that riverbed. I really have no explanation for how this works or how life could even function in such a way. And you know what? That's perfectly fine because I don't want to know. I know what I saw. I know that that thing was there in reality. It wasn't a dream or a nightmare. I didn't imagine it or hallucinate. I mean, I can't even do zombie movies and I can barely now do funerals. Oh. You wouldn't be able to do it either if death had literally started to analyze you the way that it did to me that day. I have no way to explain anything about what I saw, but I stand by my experience because it's going to haunt me forever. It wasn't until 2019 that I even saw anything that remotely resembled what it was I saw all those years ago on the riverbank. I was watching season 3 of a show called Stranger Things. A lot of you have probably watched it, and a lot of you probably know exactly what it is that I'm about to explain and compare these two things. It was when the rats started to explode and congeal together to form the mind flare. I got a pit in my stomach that went all the way down. 
I had to turn it off for several weeks until I managed to build up the courage to watch it. And when I did, I was dumbfounded by how much the Mind Flayer actually looked like the creature that I saw forming when I was a child. I mean, obviously, Stranger Things is a fictional show, but maybe they got the idea from something they saw once upon a time as well. Maybe in this case, science fiction is science fact. All I know is, the thing I saw all those years ago on the riverbed looked exactly like the Mind Flayer. And it still terrifies me just thinking about it to this day. <laughs>